Okay. Uh, well, it's, it's important for Marxists to study world relations because Lenin explained that uh, one of the preconditions, or rather one of the conditions for a pre-revolutionary situation, developing revolutionary situation, is splits in the ruling class, the inability of the ruling class to govern as they once did. And the question of war and conflict on an international scale is obviously fraught with splits of, between different uh, national ruling classes, different national bourgeois groups, but also within individual, uh, individual uh, national ruling classes. And of course for Marxists as well, the other, the other side of this question is the role of the working class in international relations. That's often not discussed when uh, international relations are discussed in an academic context. But for us, uh, the role of the working class, the independent role of the working class on the stage of world history is very important. So we can think about that in the context of this, of this question as well. On the specific question of will there be a, a World War III, a third world war, uh, it does seem like the people in charge, the people who actually have the, the capacity to make these kind of decisions, don't really seem to know themselves, judging from their statements, for example, in the press and their, and their actions. Um, so just today or yesterday, uh, Trump, having spent the last few weeks ratcheting up the, the pressure and, and the, the tensions around North Korea, he said, uh, he described uh, Kim Jong-un as a smart cookie. For someone as young as he is, it's amazing what he's been able to achieve, uh, he said. And he said he'd be honoured to meet with him. And this is after having been pouring petrol on the, on the, on the fire, if you like, of the, of the situation in that region. But at the same time, of course, he sent this very, power, very powerful armada to, uh, to the Korean Peninsula. And uh, he's been threatening that uh, if the Chinese don't do something about North Korea, then we're going to do something, effectively implying that uh, the US would strike North Korea first, a preemptive strike. Uh, and uh, in the same interview, actually, in which he was talking about how, how much of a smart cookie Kim Jong-un is, he also said that... Uh, but at the same time, of course, uh, the outcome of this could be a nuclear war and millions of people would die. So like, he, he's not giving a very clear, consistent uh, message. It doesn't seem like he's particularly in control of the situation. But of course, this is what Trump is like. like that is, this, isn't con this, this attitude is not confined to uh, this particular question. He generally gives that impression. And in fact, uh, on the question of war in particular, we've come to, we know to, to expect that from politicians, right? Blustering uh, rhetoric, Tory ministers or ex-Tory ministers saying that Britain might go to war with Spain. Like, it's, it's nonsense uh, that they talk. And the media, of course, tries to sensationalise these things for the, for the sake of getting hits on their websites or, or newspaper sales. And of course, we understand, or Marxists understand, like we, like we do with everything else, that, uh, that war is, uh, or, or anything like this isn't about individuals. Individuals play a role. Personalities, of course, play a role. Individuals do make history to a certain extent and within certain limits. That's the point. So we have to approach the question of, uh, of will there be another world war or any potential conflict in the future within the, the confines of, of historical materialism, of the actual general historical processes that are taking place, and especially the political processes that are taking place. And politics is, of course, driven by, by much broader questions. And war is a question of politics. It's not something separate to politics. I'm sure many of you have heard of uh, a, a, a military theorist called Clausewitz, uh, who said that war is just the continuation of politics by other means. So to really understand what's going on in the world, the international world relations, so on, we really need to understand the general political context in which all of this is taking place. And for us, then, we need to look at, in general, world relations, but also the history of, of the world wars, for example, of the past, uh, to be able to answer this question of, of do we think there will be uh, a third world war. So on that, uh, on that point, what, 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 it, what was it that caused the first world war? and uh, the Second World War. Well, uh, I think uh, I won't, that, that is a subject in itself, of course, that we could spend uh, an hour or so talking about, uh, but we don't have that kind of time, so I'll be necessarily brief. But I think you can say that, that the First World War was called, there was a development of capitalism. There was the, from the Industrial Revolution up until 1914, capitalism was advancing uh, by leaps and bounds. And, uh, and new capitalist powers were coming onto the, the stage of history, in particular, of course, Germany, Japan, 
these kind of uh, countries, and the United States. And, uh, and, and capitalism developed to such, and capitalism was developing its, uh, spreading its tentacles all over the world in the way that Marx and Engels predicted in the Communist Manifesto, globalization and so on, and imperialism. And, uh, and the result was that come 1914, with the new powers on the, the new capitalist powers on the stage of history, there was a need for a redivision of the world amongst the powerful uh, imperialist nations. And that's really what the First World War was about. It was a conflict for the redivision of the world amongst these powers. Um, and, uh, and, and crucially, it was a direct clash right, between those powers. It wasn't done by proxies or anything else. It was a direct clash between the most powerful nations. And, uh, and you can say that World War II, under the impact of the crash of 1929, this was a continuation, really, of the, of, of the redivision, or the attempt at redivision, the battle for, the, for control over markets that was started in the First World War. Okay, so uh, on that basis, why haven't we had a Third World War already? It's not as if international conflict has disappeared. It's not as if imperial, the question of imperialist control over certain markets has, uh, has vanished. Why hasn't there been a Third World War? Uh, before now, well, I think there's a number of uh, a number of quest- a number of points that that are important to consider with this. Obviously, since the end of the Second World War, since 1945, you've had the domination, or you had the domination for a whole period of the United States and the USSR, uh, and these two these two blocks, these two powers, really dominated the whole world. And of course, there was rivalry, there was competition. Yes, but not in the same way that there was rivalry and competition between the powers just before the First World War. Just before the First World War, these powers were, uh, were, were rapidly developing. Capitalism was driving everything forwards. And, uh, and they were all uh, in, a, in a relatively powerful situation. And so they had to, fight, they had to battle it out for domination, for control over world markets. What you had at the end of the Second World War, it's a very different period. It's the period after which that fight has taken place. After which uh, the, nation, the, the powerful nations, the previously powerful nations, have been slogging out for years, for decades, and have exhausted each other uh, militarily and economically and everything else. Domination under those circumstances is very different to domination uh, in the previous period. And it, it makes it easier to dominate, basically, the world on that basis. It gives a certain stability to the world. And that's what you had. Whilst you had this rivalry, you did have a certain stability in knowing that there were two powers which were able to sit astride the, the ruins of the First and Second World War, if you like, the ruins of the old empires. And then so coupled with that, you also had relative economic stability uh, in, in this period. Uh, there was no need to conquer new markets, to carve out new spheres of influence. There was obviously a battle over these things, but again, it was not the same as the conditions uh, before the First World War. And... Uh, there was another, another factor as well to, to take into account, was uh, that the ruling class, they learned from the experience of these wars, particularly they learned how these wars ended or what the outcome, what the product of these wars was in the political sphere and the social sphere, particularly the impact on the working class. How did the First World War end? It ended, first of all, on the basis of the Russian Revolution in 1917, and secondly, on the basis of revolution in Germany in 1918, 1923, repeated attempts at uh, the working class taking power in, in that country, which failed, obviously, but that's really what brought the First World War to an end. And again, at the end of the Second World War, what happened? You saw a whole wave all around the world of colonial revolutions, revolutions in the ex-colonial countries, trying to shake off the power of their imperial masters. And Lenin points out, he said, war is the midwife to revolution. And the ruling class know this. They've learned this. This has been the case. Uh, this was the case with those world wars, but it's been the case with smaller wars as well. And they're wary of this fact. They don't enter into wars on that basis uh, very lightly. I think also uh, another reason why we haven't yet seen a third world war is the proliferation of nuclear weapons. It's almost... Uh, a contradictory, a dialectical sort of contradiction, where you think actually uh, the capacity to destroy people, to beat other people in wars, has developed so far and is now possessed, of course, by, by multiple countries that actually it pushes world war uh, off, the, off the table, off the cards. Because on the basis of nuclear war, it becomes extremely expensive, um, not least politically. Right? It's, uh, they, they would be very hard for a politician in Russia or the United States or Britain or any other nuclear nation to justify a conflict with another major nuclear power because of the inevitability of retaliation. 
you would effectively be asking for a mandate from people to, uh, to wipe out one of your own cities, because that would be the result if Britain launched a nuclear uh, weapon against another nuclear power, another major power, there would be a retaliatory uh, strike. Well, no one is going to, no one's going to back that kind of politics. No one's going to support that kind of politics. They will do anything they can to stop that happening. If war is the midwife of revolution, then nuclear war is even more so. If conventional war is the midwife of nuclear war, even more so. People will not stand for politicians who, of course, will be safe in their bunkers and everything else. They will not stand for that kind of uh, politics. So politically, it's, it's impossible, really, uh, for the ruling class, for there to be a clash between two dominant nuclear powers, for example, for there to be world war in the way that we understand the First World War and the Second World War. But, of course, economically, it's very expensive as well. You're talking about sustaining massive economic... Businesses will be wiped out, workers will be wiped out. There'll be enormous economic uh, losses to be borne. And again, that's not in the interest of the ruling class. Uh, that's, a, that's the kind of crisis that they will not be able to uh, survive. Uh, and so, of course, what, what you saw in the aftermath of the Second World War is therefore the, the war uh, becoming cold. It wasn't a conflict between major powers. It was fought through proxies, through sideshows, side which actually involved the major powers, but not in direct conflict with one another. Vietnam, Cuba, this kind of thing is, uh, is what you saw in this period. And then, of course, you had the collapse of the USSR. And the, the idea, the thought of, uh, of the Third World War was pushed even further down the agenda because the collapse of the USSR, obviously, it was a shot in the arm for capitalism. Both, uh, both economically, there was a whole market that previously had not been open to, to capital investment, to foreign uh, direct investment, that then was open to that kind of investment. Well, that's a shot in the arm economically. Also, of course, ideologically, this was the end of, the end of history, the end of communism, the end of socialism, and, and all the rest of it. Capitalism, free market capitalism had triumphed. And so that gave, uh, that gave a bit of impetus uh, to capitalism in general, and particularly the power of the United States, uh, U.S. imperialism. Um, which was able to consolidate its position, begin expanding NATO, for example, further and further encroaching into Eastern Europe, and the spheres of influence that Russia had previously uh, held. Obviously, all of this pushed world... Like, the United States was completely dominant. The question of World War III was, uh, was very much off the cards on that basis. Now, that, on that last point, that is no longer the case. Well, it is the case. It is true to say that the United States is by far the most militarily powerful... Uh, is, is United States imperialism is the most powerful force on the planet, militarily, of course, economically as well. Though. There's no question about this. U.S. imperialism is the most powerful uh, force around. But what has, uh, what has changed, or rather what is becoming increasingly clear, the change that is becoming increasingly clear, is the relative decline of U.S. imperialism compared to what it once was. And in my opinion, this is really epoch-defining for us. It, we are living through the period of the decline of US imperialism. And this is having an enormous impact, I think, on uh, world relations. This is the prism through which we have to understand world relations. Um, <clears throat> now, this isn't a brand new phenomenon. Obviously, the limits of US imperialism were revealed by the mess of the Iraq war, the Afghan Afghanistan war, this, sorts of th this sort of thing, the inability of, of uh, the United States to project its kind of image of liberal utopia, liberal capitalism, onto these countries and, and the, gen the failures of those in invasions. But uh, it's all, I would also say that it's not by chance that this relative decline of US imperialism is coming to the fore and is particularly acute in a period of economic crisis. Because... Post-World uh, post War II, the United States accounted for 50% of world GDP. That's now halved to 25%. That's a massive decline uh, in, in that period of time. Um, it used to be, in that period, with the Marshall Plan and everything else, the United States was the world's biggest creditor, lent out the most money. And today it's the world's biggest debtor. It's the country in the world that owes the most money to other countries. This is a massive reversal of its, uh, of its economic position. And Lenin said that politics is concentrated economics. And so uh, understanding the economic change or the change in the economic power, the economic position of the United States is important to understanding its political position and the strength of its imperial power. 
Perhaps uh, the most significant change uh, in, uh, in US politics is uh, the fact that there isn't really the political will uh, for further foreign adventures. I mean, there is, and this again is, is tied up entirely with the, with the question of, of the crisis of capital, the economic crisis, the crisis of capitalism. So, and there's this, this questioning of the establishment, this mistrust of politicians uh, and the state in general. Of course, the army, the military is a big part of the state. This is what Trump and Sanders represents, and you're seeing the same thing everywhere else. There is this general mistrust of, uh, of the state, coupled with the, the hatred, the anger over the Iraq and Afghan wars and the, and the lies that were told in order to convince people to support those wars. This has all now been exposed in Britain as well as the United States, of course. You have the, the obvious um, juxtaposition of crashing living standards, declining living standards, people out of work and everything else, and the enormous amount that it costs to send uh, troops to go to war and, and the production of, uh, of jets and, and aircraft carriers and so on. And all this was then reflected, of course, with uh, Obama's failed attempt to get a vote through Congress to bomb Syria. Like, all this anger was then, was then reflected in that. Like, at, once upon a time, the United States could march into whatever country, even Iraq and Afghanistan, just sort of wandered in with, uh, with little opposition at home. But now they can't... It's, then it, Obama wasn't even asking to send troops. He was just asking to, to drop some bombs. And he, couldn't even, he didn't even feel confident enough getting a vote through uh, Congress on that basis. And that actually, uh, I'll come back to this more, but that also it shows the potential for the working class to assert itself against the imperialist adventures of, uh, and to assert itself against war and conflict uh, on any scale, uh, in, in the ma even in the major imperialist countries. But this, so this question of, of the decline of US imperialism, we should ask then, what does this mean for world relations. Is this situation with North Korea an indication of a crisis which is going to open up a, a battle to redivide world markets? Is that what Syria represents? Is that what the Ukraine situation in uh, 2014 represents? Uh, does that mean, can we look at this and say, look, this is a, this is a crisis, a, an attempt by, by the ruling class to redivide the, the markets among, among themselves? Does this mean, therefore, that there will be a, a World War III? Well, I'd say, uh, I'd say that the answer to the first part of that, uh, decline of U.S. imperialism, redivision of markets, I'd say the answer is probably yes to the first part of that. But I'd say the answer to the second part, does this mean that there will be a third world war, because that's what caused the second world war, the first world war, or anything else? I'd say the answer to that is, is probably no. Um, <clears throat> so I'll explain, uh, I'll explain those, those things. First of all, on this first question, this decline of U.S. imperialism, obviously as... U.S. imperialism is cracking up, like, or as it's disintegrating, these cracks are opening up into which other powers, which are developing economically, are able to, uh, to step. I'm specifically talking, of course, or most obviously, this is uh, Russia and China. So uh, Russia, in 2008, uh, if you remember, uh, invaded Georgia, or sent tanks into Georgia, drew, the, drew a line in the sand, basically, because, uh, because the, the, like NATO uh, was ex had been continually expanding into Russian spheres of influence after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and Russia could do nothing about it. It was, uh, it was being humiliated at every turn, basically, as NATO continually expanded eastwards, until actually it was ending up with NATO bases on its border and this sort of thing. The Baltic states uh, all joined NATO and so on. And, uh, and there was a move uh, to, to get Georgia into this as well. And, uh, and Russia in 2008, it really drew the line. It said, that enough is enough. You're not coming any further. You're not having Georgia in, uh, in your alliance. And, uh, and, and Russia was able to, to get NATO to back off on that base, so to get the West to back off. Russia actually won that fight over the question of Georgia. And you saw exactly the same thing with Ukraine in 2014, uh, a country which Russia has traditionally considered its... Uh, sphere of influence. Uh, it was going to sign. Yanukovych was going to sign a pact with the EU, if you remember. That, and there were these, uh, or rather, he was going to sign. He he, he was going to sign a pact with the EU. Then he said he was going to sign a pact with Russia. And then there were these. Uh, there was effectively the civil war broke out, and, uh, and and Russia annexed the Crimea and this sort of thing. And it has prevented again. 
Russia has humiliated the West on the question of uh, Ukraine. It's flexed its muscles, it's asserted itself. It's been able, basically, to, uh, to point out or, or to, to bring to the surface, to exploit the fact that the United States has overstretched itself. It's not able to bring these countries into its sphere of influence. It's not able to commit troops on the ground or, or even the kind of political resources necessary to bring these countries in. And Russia has, has correctly identified that this crack is opening up and it is opportunistically, Putin has opportunistically moved in and reasserted Russian influence in these places. And this is a real blow to Western imperialism, to NATO. Of course, NATO is just the plaything, effectively, or was dominated by uh, the United States. And, uh, and NATO's response, obviously, to all this has been pretty pathetic. They've posted 4,000 troops to, the, to, to Eastern Europe, um, even when the most conservative estimates say that uh, you'd need about 40,000 troops to stop any kind of Russian invasion if that were to actually happen. And, uh, and on top of that, the alliance is split. Like, this is an important, an important point about the power of Western imperialism, the power of NATO. Like, the NATO alliance is not as powerful as it once was. Uh, Germany, France, Italy, in the last few years, all have suggested that they want slightly closer ties with Russia, even despite NATO's apparent opposition, deployment of troops and so on, to, uh, to growing Russian influence. Britain, meanwhile, has, uh, at the last meeting of the G7, Boris Johnson was pushing for harsher sanctions on Russia and was, uh, was completely ignored. Uh, humiliatingly so, the French foreign minister, after that meeting, was asked, well, wasn't the question of more sanctions on Russia raised? And uh, he said, yeah, well, only, only Johnson was talking about that. Uh, and, uh, and nobody else, so it's definitely not going to happen. Uh, it was completely dismissed, but there is this kind of split in, uh, in the NATO alliance there as well. I, I mean, how, and how could it be otherwise? The basis, the conditions in which NATO was formed were conditions of Cold War and of economic uh, prosperity. And now that is not the situation anymore. Increasingly, Germany, for example, is reliant on, on German... Uh, Germany is reliant on Russian gas, uh, increasingly. And, and the different states are trying to deal with the economic crisis in different ways, protecting their own countries, their own national bourgeoisies. And this means that they will have different strategies. How could the NATO alliance really last uh, in any meaningful way under these circumstances? I think this question of splits and crisis within the NATO alliance is only going to continue in the future. The biggest crack in, uh, in, in NATO, though, is Turkey. Turkey is a, a NATO member. And... Uh, it's cracking, really, in the face of, uh, again, this decline of U.S. imperialism, but also the strength, the relative strength of Russia. We shouldn't get carried away. Russia is not even close to being uh, as strong as, as um, the United States militarily, certainly not economically. It faces economic crisis of its own. It faces sanctions and everything else. We shouldn't get carried away with this. But nevertheless, it is able to assert itself more than it was once able to in the face of the decline of the United States. And, uh, and if you remember, um, in 2015, was it? Maybe it was last year. Russia, uh, sorry, Turkey downed that, shot down that Russian jet. And this was all part of the conflict in Syria. But it did that. Turkey didn't like the fact that Russia was going into, into Syria, sending troops into Syria, because it disrupted to, uh, Erdogan's plans for the region. So they downed this Russian jet in the hope that that would provoke Russia into attacking Turkey, and Turkey as a NATO member could call on all the other NATO members to go to war against Russia. But of course, uh, Putin was far too clever for that, uh, and he, he didn't ignore it. He imposed extremely harsh economic sanctions on Turkey and wiped out some of his proxies in Syria, and, uh, and NATO did nothing. NATO uh, refused to act uh, at all in the way that Turkey wanted it to. And this, uh, this has pushed Erdogan away from, uh, from the alliance a little bit. It's still a member, of course. But, uh, but what you saw is that Turkey actually then did almost a 180-degree turn and has actually been part of the negotiations, the deals over Syria with Russia. The reason, and that's a major blow against the NATO alliance. That's a, a major, a really important military power. Turkey spends a lot on its military. Really important military power leaning, it hasn't switched sides, it's not on either side really, it's balancing between the two, Erdogan's right? balancing between the, between the two sides, but he's moving, he's leaning more towards Russia than he had done uh, in the past. Now the reason for that 
is that Russia calls the shots in Syria. That's what Erdogan's interested in. He's interested in defeating the Kurds in, in uh, Rojava and, and the YPG and so on. And, uh, and he recognizes that the, this is a recognition of the fact that the United States does not call the shots in Syria. Russia calls the shots there. And actually, uh, the, uh, the, there was a, a peace conference, a peace conference, a roundtable discussion to try and sort out, sort out the conflict in, uh, in Syria. And it was the first such uh, conference involving uh, countries in the Middle East to which the United States was explicitly not invited. It involved uh, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, these kind, Iran, these kind of countries. The United States was not invited because it does not control the situation at all in Syria. None of the people that it backs have any chance of, uh, of getting anywhere, of holding any power. And this is a major, a major turning point, really. That, that conference is a major um, defeat, humiliation for U.S. imperialism and a major victory, really, for uh, Russia. Uh, and this question of, of Turkey uh, leaning uh, towards that side is, is, is a symptom of that. Because the, the point now, obviously, the major, the major conflict uh, when it comes to Syria between the United States and Russia is the question, does the Assad family remain in power? Russia says yes, and the United States says no. But at the moment, now, after the fall of Aleppo in the uh, beginning of this year, I think, there is no way that Assad can be beaten by the rebel forces that are in uh, Syria at the moment. He, his forces now control about 70% of the country. And, uh, and it's thanks to the backing of, uh, of, of Russia, uh, largely, and, and other, other countries in the region. But... Uh, <clears throat> But this also, like the, the continued regime of, uh, of Assad in Syria, is, a, is an insult. It's a, it's a humiliation for uh, the U.S. ruling class. It's also worth pointing out that actually, not only can the United States not effectively intervene in the situation in Syria, but uh, every attempt that it does make to intervene in the situation, it actually damages. It has damaged its own interests. It's actually set itself back. Uh, repeatedly in, this, uh, in its efforts. Because uh, what it's found is that it has basically had to make alliances with various different groups because the groups that it backs keep uh, failing or, or being defeated or pushed back by other forces. It's ended up fighting with three different, uh, with, or with blocks which are in three different alliances. It's ended up backing people who are opposed to Saudi Arabia, but Saudi Arabia is supposed to be a United States ally. It's ended up backing people, backing the Kurds, for example, uh, and this is obviously alienating Turkey, but it needs Turkey on side to fight effectively against the Russians, uh, and this kind of thing. And so what the United States has done, everything they've done in Syria has burnt bridges with, uh, with their traditional allies in the region, and it's left itself uh, very vulnerable. No wonder then Donald Trump, in his campaigning, really expressed the feeling of, the, of, the, of some elements of the US ruling class this kind of knee-jerk reaction of, we just don't, we don't want to get involved. Just leave them to it. I want nothing to do with that, because everything they do in that region is wrong. And that is a classic symptom of, of an of a, of a imperialism in crisis, if you like. Yes, United States imperialism is the most powerful on the planet, but it doesn't mean it's the most powerful in every region on Earth. And in Syria in particular, Russia has been able to assert itself much more than the United States. But of course... For, uh, when it comes to the Middle East, for the United States, it has actually slipped slightly in terms of its strategic importance. The United States itself is now the second largest uh, producer of oil in the world, thanks to their, their fracking, right? And, uh, and so the strategic importance of the Middle East has slipped down uh, slightly for them. Not, uh, we shouldn't over-exaggerate that as well. It's still important. But nevertheless, um, <clears throat> in comparison to that, or rather... The question of China, in comparison to the question of, of Russia and the Middle East, is, uh, is much more important. Russia and the Middle East, really, and the, and the problems that they represent militarily, economically, and the question in, the, in diplomatic and world relations. The, the, the problem that they represent, really, is nothing compared to, uh, compared to China. China, obviously, has been developing economically, and it's now a very powerful uh, economic uh, state. And uh, its power is, is very strong in particular in the region around the South China Sea, uh, as you would expect. And it's really asserting this dominance now politically and militarily, this economic dominance politically and militarily, uh, 
Uh, for example, by building, by its program of island building in the South China Sea. It's, it's effectively building islands in bits of water that are not necessarily definitely theirs under international law, and it's just claiming it as theirs. Well, that's our island, therefore all the water around it is ours as well. And they're basically trying to take over the South China Sea on that basis. But more than that, they're also pursuing this policy now of trying to win traditional U.S. allies in the region to their side. So, for example... Um, the president of the Philippines, relatively newly elected, D D Duterte, yeah. Um, he is, he's a real piece of work. He's a real gangster, like much more of a gangster than Donald Trump is. Like this, was a guy, this is a guy who admits to having been involved in uh, uh, drive-by shootings and this sort of thing, uh, and, and like the murder of, of drug addicts and stuff in, uh, in, in the Philippines, in the town where he, was, where he was mayor, I think. But this guy is... Uh, he, he is, he is Trump-like, but he's also extremely hostile to the United States. Now, the reason for that, I mean, there is his character, he's just a generally a, a belligerent uh, character, but he is, uh, on, his, on his visit to China, after he became president, he basically said, uh, it's, it's the Philippines, Russia, and China against the United States. I want nothing more to do with the United States. He also called it in another, another point, because Obama was criticizing him for this war he was carrying out on drug dealers and all sorts of human rights abuses and this sort of thing. So his response was to call Obama a son of a whore. Literally, those were the words that he used, right? This guy is completely uh, over the top. But obviously, he represents a certain layer, a powerful layer, within the ruling class of the Philippines, who have recognized that China, that is in their economic interests to ally themselves with China. The United States is not their main trading partner. It, Philippines is, a, is, a, is an ally of the United States for historical reasons, on the basis of historical uh, military victories in, in that region. But, uh, but now China is the dominant economic power, and it's more in their interest to ally themselves with China. And sure enough, on this visit that uh, Duterte made to uh, China, they signed loads of economic agreements. Uh, rights were opened up to the disputed islands, allowing the allowing Filipino fishing boats to go and uh, fish there and this sort of thing. Basically, the message that China was sending was, if you ditch the United States and, uh, and come and be friends with us, then we will invest loads of money in your country and you can have access to all these islands that we, you know, all the islands in the sea that, we, that we've been building or that we've been annexing or claiming or whatever. This was the clear message that, that China was sending. And... Uh, and this, the Philippines is not the only example of this. Um, in Thailand, a few years ago, 2014, maybe somebody else knows better than that, maybe 2013, there was a coup in Thailand. And basically, uh, the coup was for kind of internal, it wasn't, it wasn't US and China maneuvering internally to, to oust this particular person, but the effect of the coup was that the US proxy, if you like, the US ally was ousted and, uh, and the military uh, came into power. And the United States, angry that their, that their ally had been ousted from power, began to criticize the, the coup. Well, not too harshly, but criticized nevertheless. Well, that obviously pushed uh, the Thai coup leaders, the generals and so on, away from the United States. And China, seeing its opportunity, pounced and, and welcomed the new government in, uh, in Thailand. And this is what has basically been, uh, this is the MO of, of, of the Chinese ruling class, basically. They're not, they're not openly kind of invading countries or, or aggressively, using aggressive diplomacy necessarily. But, uh, but what they're doing, even with, uh, with countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, South Korea, these are all staunch, historically staunch US allies. But basically what they're doing is they're asserting their economic uh, power. They're also asserting their military power. Last year... There were more, the Japanese had to scramble more jets to, to, to head off uh, incursions into their airspace by Chinese jets than at any point ever in history. It's gone up dramatically. Hundreds, like hundreds more incursions, hundreds more jets, hundreds of more jets were scrambled than in, previous, uh, than any, in any previous year. It's asserting itself militar militarily and, uh, and economically. And then politically, it's basically, uh, it's pointing to the inability of the United States to intervene in Syria to protect its allies, the inability of the United States to intervene in Ukraine to protect its allies. And it's basically saying, look, they won't act. they're just giving them a nudge and a wink every time that happens. And just saying, look, the United States aren't what they used to be. They, they're not all they're cracked up to be. We are the ones who can actually protect you. It's much more in your interest to, uh, to join us. And this is causing splits in the ruling classes of these countries. 
And inevitably, you're seeing a pro-Chinese faction develop in all of these, but even these strong uh, U.S. Um, countries, strong, strongly pro-U.S. allies. <clears throat> we shouldn't, again, we shouldn't get carried away. There is, it's not all, all the travel is not in one direction. Um, <clears throat> in Myanmar, for example, the opposite thing has happened. Uh, and that borders China. So that uh, tradition has always been pro-Chinese. The U.S. are in the process now of trying to win it back over and, and this sort of thing. So it's not, all, it's not all in one direction, but it is having an effect. There was recently a regional, a, a regional meeting of all of these, uh, all these countries in this region. Traditionally, these meetings have always condemned, in one form or another, the Chinese practice of building islands in the South China Sea. And in this meeting that happens this month, like last few weeks, I can't remember exactly when, they, uh, they didn't condemn it. it no, no, almost no mention was made of it, which, uh, which is demonstrative, again, of, of the fact that Chinese interests are being considered more and more important, and not upsetting the Chinese is becoming more and more important for all of these uh, countries. Now, this, then, is the political context, right, in which we have to look at what's happening in North Korea, and we can, we can try and make sense of that situation. Obviously, Trump himself, he's, he's really been the guy provoking this uh, situation, uh, the, provoking the, the, the rising tensions in, in the country, in the region. He faces a dual pressure of uh, economic discontent, uh, of domestic discontent, rather, sorry, and, uh, and growing Chinese power. And he already identified the growing power of China in his campaign as something that he didn't like, reflecting a certain feeling amongst the U.S. Uh, ruling class. Now, uh, he obviously needs to distract to a certain extent from his failure to deliver much of what he promised in his uh, campaign. He's under a lot of pressure domestically about his associates' dealings with Russia and all, all this sort of thing. He needs, to, he needs to distract from all that. North Korea is a, an obvious target, a clear enemy. That's obviously uh, true. But uh, more interesting from the point of view of world relations is the fact that he uh, inevitably sees this and clearly sees this as an opportunity to, uh, to leverage China to have a bit of a go uh, at China. This is actually not a million miles from Obama's policy. This is an important point to note. Obama had this policy of a pivot to Asia, uh, his policy of uh, the, trans trans the TTP, the everyone but China trade deal, right? Exclude China, attack China, pressure China into, into backing off on its, uh, or trying to defeat it economically. Well, this is Trump trying to do a similar thing in a, in a Trump sort of style. Uh, much more belligerent, much more angry, much more uh, noise and fury. But uh, it's actually a similar policy, which again points to this fact that, that world relations and war and conflict and everything, it's not about one individual's uh, approach to this whole thing. There are strategic, economic, political class interests at work, which push individuals in particular directions. Really, I think Trump sees this, sees North Korea as an opportunity to flex uh, US muscles in the region. Um, actually, uh, if perhaps this is giving him too much credit, uh, perhaps him and his advisors haven't thought this through, although I suspect they're, they're cleverer than many people give them credit for. But you could even see this as the United States trying to employ the same strategy that China uses on, it, on US allies in the region. The, uh, the United States is, is, is being belligerent towards uh, North Korea and is putting pressure on China to put pressure on North Korea to slow down or, or stop its nuclear program, implement sanctions against North Korea, this sort of thing. So that the United States can then say, uh, look, North Korea, they're an ally of China, but as soon as the US starts flexing its muscles, they buckle to what we want, because we're the most powerful people in the region. On that basis, it's trying to shore up its allies against the, the Chinese winking and nudging over what's happening in Ukraine and Syria and everything else. I think there's probably an element of, uh, of that strategy there. But you can really see, uh, you can really see the strategy of Trump, you can, and you can really see his gangsterism as well, uh, with this, uh, the fact that he, he launched those 59 missiles uh, into Syria whilst he was having dinner with the, with the Chinese president. Now, that is, that's not by coincidence. And even, actually, I think, you know, the fact that he... The fact that he could remember the details of the dinner, but couldn't remember the country that he was launching the missiles into, I think that actually speaks, but you can put it down to him being an idiot, and yeah, I mean, clearly that is a symptom of that. But I think there's, there's, there's actually even more to it than that, right? Like, he, 
He remembers the details of the dinner with the president because that was the important thing. It doesn't matter where they launch the missiles. The point is, it's a message. We, the United States is going to launch missiles at people. That's what we do. We will assert our power. We'll assert, it doesn't matter where. They couldn't do it on North Korea. You launch missiles at North Korea, you'll get a nuclear weapon back. You do it to Syria, there's, there's, they can't do anything. They're completely defenseless. It was sending a message. You can see that kind of gangsterism. You know, like, uh, are you, you, enjoying your, you enjoying your chocolate cake there, uh, Mr. President? Let me tell you something. We've just launched 59 uh, missiles into, into Syria. You got anything to say about that? Like, it's, that, it's real gangsterism. Uh, it's a real gangster kind. But this is, this is what... Uh, I think this is the game that he's playing, basically. And then, of course, he's using the fact that there are these raised tensions in the region to ring round all the... He, you know, he's had phone calls with uh, South Korea, with Thailand. He's even invited Duterte, the uh, Filipino president, to the United States now in the, in the context of all of this. Like he's using the instability to try and reassert a bit of uh, US uh, control. And, the, and, he's fly, and his, his big armada has been flying joint uh, training exercises with Japanese and, and South Korean jets. And it's sort of like he's really flexing US muscles in the region, basically in response to this, this ongoing policy of China to try and win people over to their, to their side of the fence. Of course, he's going about it like a bull in a china shop. He's claiming that South Korea are going to have to pay for the, the missile defense shield that they're setting up to, to protect against North Korea. And he, he throws in the odd random comment about meeting Kim Jong-un and this sort of thing, which only conserves to confuse the whole uh, situation. But I think overall, none of this should surprise... This strategy of, of the United States of Trump shouldn't really surprise us. Because uh, really, as its, as its power is declining relatively speaking, it is being backed into a corner by China. You're seeing the old world refuse to give way to the new world. And inevitably, under those circumstances, the old world, feeling its power slipping from its grasp, it will lash out in, in quite unpredictable and quite dangerous ways. And that really, I think, is what this ratcheting up of tensions with North Korea represents. It's, it's, the, it's the United States ruling class expressing itself in, in Trump's own inimitable style, lashing out against, against uh, the fact that it can feel its power slipping from its grasp but can't really do anything about it. And of course this just means that, uh, that there will, the future does hold massive instability uh, for that region in particular but world relations in general. Of course you can't rule out conflict of some kind. Uh, these things, that is, that is uh, potentially going to happen. And, uh, and of course, like conflicts like that, and uh, particularly um, whipping up nationalist movements and this sort of thing in certain countries, as, as, the, as China and the United States vie for position in, in these various different countries in, that, in Southeast Asia, they will back different proxies and they'll be based, as these things always are, on certain sect, like religious sectarian lines or nationalistic lines or whatever it is. You can, there are always things like that in every country that you can use to base yourself on. Yeah, but they can develop a life of their own. And especially when the working class is involved, these things can, can spiral out of the control of the ruling class. And you can, on that basis, see massive instability as well. Um, <clears throat> the question is, there's obviously a question about China's position on North Korea. I don't have time to go into it. But China is in favor, basically, of North Korea remaining as it is. Right? It, doesn't, it, it can use a slightly unstable, slightly mad dictator in the region, not least as a buffer between it and the United States forces and bases that are stationed in uh, South Korea. The question is, uh, out of all this instability, which is inevitable in the future, will there be a third world war? I think the answer to that, as I mentioned earlier, is no. Because uh, the First World War broke out at a time, the first world war broke out at a time when, uh, when, when capital capitalism had been going through a period of boom. Its nation, like capitalist nation, the powerful capitalist nations were extremely powerful. They're at their peak, uh, if you like. Whereas today, the most powerful capitalist nation, the most powerful imperialist nation, there, is in massive amounts of debt, in not, and crippling debt, to the second most powerful, uh, economically speaking, anyway, second most powerful nation, uh, that is the United States, being in debt to China. That's not a picture of enormous strength. You're not going to see a conflict between a creditor nation and a debtor nation in that way. It's not in the interests, necessarily, uh, of either of them. China, obviously, in turn, of course, has a massive economic crisis looming. It's, mass it's got massive overproduction, enormous debts uh, at every level of the state and in private companies as well. And, uh, and, and so they're, they're not likely to want to go to war on any large scale. 
and a crisis is likely to, to preempt any attempt to do that anyway. Uh, because that would be very expensive at a time when the Chinese economy is facing enormous crisis. Above all, though, I think the most important point is the fact that the working class is particularly strong uh, today, certainly numerically stronger than it's ever been at any point in history, particularly in a country like China, for example, where you've seen this enormous, over a long period of time, this enormous movement of people from the countryside into the cities, the development then of a proletarian, a working class. And we've seen before the capacity of the working class, the ability of the working class to oppose war, to fight against war. The First World War broke out at a time when capitalism had been in a boom, the leadership of the working class had been bought off, convinced of, the, of, of how great the, uh, the capitalist system was, how you could win reforms and this sort of thing. It was coming, in, it was coming out of a period of, of capitalist development, fast capitalist development. Now, today, we're not in that period. Very few people have many illusions anymore. In the, or Very few people would agree that capitalism is the best system that we could possibly have, that there's no problems with capitalism, that we must fight to defend capitalism, that we must fight to defend our national capitalism. No, not only have we had enormous crisis, massive economic global crisis since 2008, but even before that, since the 1980s, for example, uh, in this country, many other uh, major developed capitalist countries, there's been privatizations and outsourcing and slashing of wages and conditions and everything else. <coughs> there wouldn't be that desire for a defense of, uh, of the capitalist system anymore. And of course, at the end of the First World War, you saw the working class ending uh, those wars, as I mentioned earlier, with Russia and Germany. More, much more recently, you saw enormous protests against the Iraq war, and you saw uh, enormous protests against the bombing of Syria, and that latter one, of course, was successful. And these, uh, these were mass mobilizations of ordinary people, right? Ordinary people can intervene on the stage of history and prevent this sort of thing uh, happening. And I'd say that to date, like, the more global and the more deadly the war, the more likely it would be to provoke massive uh, political opposition. And so, as I mentioned earlier, like if you're, if you're talking about a nuclear war, which is what a clash between a world war, as in a, clash, a direct clash between major imperialist powers, that would be a nuclear war. And if you saw that uh, kind of thing, I think there would be uh, opposition, the like of which we haven't seen before. Even like it wouldn't, the, the, the opposition to the Iraq war would pale in comparison, right? Not only would there be sympathy for the ordinary people who would be killed by the, by the, by the nuclear bombs that are being dropped, but uh, obviously people would be furious at the thought that this is obviously going to provoke a retaliation, and, uh, and people wouldn't stand for that. Of course, there's also now, in the, on the question of the United States, the other factor that's thrown into the mix is Donald Trump himself, who actually stood on a platform of not getting involved in these kind of wars, uh, of, of, of the United States becoming a bit more isolationist. So any move at all towards any kind of warfare for him is going to undermine his support. Half the country hates him already, and then, of course, uh, the more he betrays the, the platform they actually stood on, this is going to undermine him even more. So he will face even more political opposition uh, at home. I think you can see the impotence of uh, imperialism in the face of massive working class, massive like, mass demonstrations and protests and so on. You can actually see that in, uh, in 2011, in the, in the revolutions in the Arab world, in North Africa and, and the Middle East and so on. Because what you saw there is uh, in, uh, in Egypt... A mass movement toppling Mubarak, a key ally of the United States. And in uh, Libya, you saw a mass movement which actually forced the Western powers to intervene against Gaddafi, who again was an ally of theirs. So you can actually see that it's not just a rival imperialism, it's not just Chinese imperialism who can pick off key US allies. It's actually a mass movement of the working class, which can also do the same thing. But of course, you also see in this same region, in Syria in particular, the consequences of what happens when the old regime collapses if there isn't a working class uh, party, a working class organization ready to take power and implement its own, uh, its own government, its own system, seize power for itself. You see other regional powers trying to step in, Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Russia, of course, all trying to step in. And actually, you see that whilst the, whilst the working class might be capable uh, just on the base of a spontaneous mass movement, might be capable of destroying the, the old order, reducing it to, to ruins, you know, literally reducing it to rubble. Um, what you can't, uh, or what, what doesn't happen uh, automatically on the base of a spontaneous mass movement, unless it has a kind of uh, a, a working class party, an organisation, uh, then you actually see that it's unable to replace that with anything and reaction swoops in. 
And actually, the ruins that, that were created by the first situation are, is what remains. Where the ruins that were created by, out of the old regime is what remains. And this is kind of what you have in Syria. The only way to fight against that, of course, is with a revolutionary Marxist organization fighting for socialism. And, and the tradition of that does exist in the region. There are elements of that in, for example, Nasserism, Pan-Arabism, not all of those traditions, but some of them. Uh, the best traditions of those movements, there is a history of that. The history of, of, this, of the region of the Middle East is not one of, uh, as the bourgeois often paint it, not one of just reaction and lack of democracy and anything else. No, there is a tradition of, uh, of left-wing ideas and so on. Uh, and that, could, that is what really needs to be revived, and that's what's lacking in, in these places at the moment. So, uh, so finally then, just to sum up, I mean, the, the process of the decline of US imperialism, it is slow, right? It's not, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in the next year or even five years or ten years or anything else. It will, uh, it will take some time. It's still the strongest imperialist power. China, you can see it's picking off people slowly, gradually. It's not going all out all at once. All that Russia can do is maintain a sort of frozen conflict in Syria, in Ukraine. It hasn't invaded these countries. It hasn't taken them over and drawn them wholesale into its sphere of influence. It's just freezing the conflict in these places. That's as much as it can manage at this stage. But I would say that the weakness of capitalism and the looming crisis, the looming global crisis of capitalism, which will enter a new stage very soon, in my opinion, and the potential strength of the working class really puts world war off the table, uh, certainly in the foreseeable future, probably in the long term. But that doesn't mean that you won't see enormous instability, you won't see enormous splits in the ruling class, and, uh, and a very erratic behavior on the part of people like Trump, like Kim Jong-un, which, of course, can result in, uh, in, in barbarism, in horror, in war, yes, on a small scale, on a local scale. You could see that kind of, You will definitely, actually, in my opinion, see that kind of thing. We've already seen it in Syria, in Ukraine. Localized wars, proxy wars, this sort of thing, they will become uh, much more regular. Perhaps you could call that a world war in the sense that it is the major imperialist powers through proxies fighting it out. It's not a world war in the sense that the major imperialist powers are coming into direct conflict with each other. And of course, it's also not, like, not going to be like the proxy wars of the Cold War, because at that time there were, two, there were just two major imperialist powers fighting out. Today, that's not the case. You have US imperialism, which is the most powerful, but it's on the decline. And everywhere you're seeing regional powers come to the fore and assert themselves, not on a global scale necessarily, apart from possibly China, but even China is at the moment limiting itself to its region. Russia as well in Eastern Europe, but Turkey is trying to assert itself, Iran is trying to assert itself, all these kind of countries. So it won't be, they won't be proxy wars of the kind that you saw in, uh, in, the, in the Cold War. These will be much more complicated uh, types of uh, war. And of course for Marxists, then we have to be very careful. There's a temptation when you see wars of this kind to pick a side. There's a temptation to always have to pick a side. But actually, in, for example, Syria at the moment, neither side is, is a side that, that revolutionaries, that, that people basing themselves on the interests of the working class could align themselves with. We have to talk about the need to, to build a, a proper working, an independent working class organization, uh, not one that is siding with US imperialism, Russian imperialism, Chinese imperialism, or anything else. I think, uh, finally, then, that the, the barbarism that the ruling class is willing to drag us into in the next period, in this period of instability, small wars, revolution, counter-revolution, because of course all this will lead to revolutionary movements. War is the midwife of revolution. Inevitably the working class will start to assert itself in various different countries and to various different extents. But the barbarism that they're willing to take us to will be exposed for lots of people to see and actually they will start to draw certain conclusions from that, specifically and most importantly that, that all, this, all this barbarism, all these wars, there is a direct consequence of this vying for power and influence and markets and ultimately profit. This is what is motivating all of, these, uh, all of this situation. And, uh, and so the most important conclusion that we should draw from this and that we should try to explain to people as we see these things developing around the world is that capitalism has hit a dead end. This is the best that capitalism can offer us today. And, uh, and therefore, we have to organize ourselves to, to overthrow it and to fight for socialism.